Welcome to Forbidden Planet. I'm Andrew Sumner. My special guest today is none other than Author Supreme, Kate Hartfield. How are you today, Kate? I'm doing great. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm very happy for you to join us, particularly because we're talking about your awesome new novel, The Embroidered Book, which um, viewers of this conversation can buy in a beautiful signed by Kate exclusive edition for Forbidden Planet from the links attached to this conversation. Now, what was your inspiration for the book, Kate? It actually came when I was reading Antonia Fraser's biography of Marie Antoinette several years ago. Okay. And uh, there was a little passage right at the beginning about how she and her sister Charlotte got into so much trouble as children that they had to be separated. And of course, you know, my author brain immediately dinged and I thought, well, what, what were they doing that got them in so much trouble? And, um, you know, being a fantasy writer, I immediately thought it had to be magic. Uh, so that was the inspiration for it. And then when I learned that they had actually been, had different destinies and um, the death of a sibling from smallpox actually changed around who was going to marry whom in the Habsburg family. And Marie Antoinette was never supposed to go to France, but then this accident of history happened. So all of that I found really intriguing and, and uh, it started the wheels turning. Yeah, I, I can see that. And is, is, this a, is this a period of time that you've, you've always been interested in? Yeah, I bounce around in history uh, a lot, uh, but the 18th century is really fascinating to me because it's such a period of change. Um, you know, so this book follows Marie Antoinette and her sister Charlotte uh, as they each go off to become queen, uh, one of them in France and one of them in Naples, the kingdom of Naples. And, uh, and they took very different paths to power in, in their uh, respective countries. Uh, and it just seemed really emblematic of this of this time in history when uh, so much change was was fermenting, and we had the Enlightenment philosophy and revolution brewing. Uh, but at the same time, um, you had uh, you know the the forces of order and uh, of the status quo uh, were very strong and uh, fighting back. Uh, so it's such a fascinating period in history. Of course, with uh, with two extremely strong female characters at a period of time that, of course, is uh, supremely uh, male dominated. Uh, and it seems to me those those ethics of power are something that are, are of interest to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I'm really interested in how uh, how women find ways to wield their power, especially in societies and in uh, and historical periods when uh, there have been uh, even more barriers <laughs> than there are now. Um, of course, these are two extremely privileged uh, white women from uh, very, very rich <laughs> dynasties. Uh, so they, they did come into the world with a great deal of power, but at the same time, they were part of uh, a gendered system and uh, were meant to be subservient to their husbands and had very particular roles that they were supposed to play. Uh, so within that and, and breaking outside of that, they found ways to achieve their ends and they you know charlotte in in naples was a very politically minded person and, and really wanted to rule the kingdom and she did she ruled despite her husband uh and uh, antoinette in france was was not like that but she really wanted to be a good queen and she she just kept making mistakes everything that she did uh, would take her in, in the wrong direction as we well know um, but she really, you know, had a plan to to be a good queen and to do well by her country, both her adopted country and Austria, where she came from. Um, so they did have very strong ambitions. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and court politics, of course, plays a huge role in the lives of, of the ruling class in the in the era that you're writing about. Uh, is that something that's always interested you? Yeah, I. I, I'm interested in that mainly from a sort of bigger perspective, I think, um, because I have a political science degree, so I'm really interested in the big picture of politics and how things are changing. Um, but the the politics of a court are fascinating in their own right because they uh, are a little microcosm of that. Uh, but at the same time, you have these personal relationships, and these personal relationships can change what happens in the country and and vice versa. Uh, so for a novelist, it's a really fascinating little world to explore the ideas of the bigger world around it. Do, do you think there's a degree to which the world is perhaps, uh, in an unsavory manner, returning to some sort of privileged court politics in the world we live in now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot more parallels <laughs> than, I, than I would like. <laughs> Sadly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, personality uh, and privilege uh, still matter. 
so much uh, in politics and uh, as much as we would like to, to think that it doesn't. And, um, you know, one thing that really struck me while I was writing this book is that, uh, you know, democracy is not a, a state of, of affairs. It's not a sort of static thing that uh, can be established in, in, in a binary position to authoritarianism. Um, it's, it's a constant struggle. And even within the forces that think they're fighting for democracy, it's a constant struggle. You know, we could see the revolution kind of eating itself and, and eventually turning into the, the tyranny of Napoleon. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's never something that we can take for granted. And uh, I definitely think that the privileged classes today, uh, you know, bear a lot of similarity to Versailles. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, undoubtedly true, and um, and I, I mean, it's such a fascinating parallel to me, so fascinating. I'm going to pivot out of that because I could just mm -hmm. spend an hour talking to you about this topic, um, and um, of course, um, the embroidered book comes off the back of "Armed in Her Fashion," which was your Aurora award-winning book, and your and your Alice Payne novellas. So, how mm -hmm. long a after the success you achieved there? How long were you on the creative path? to creating the embroidered book? Everything sort of overlapped. Um, you know, publishing is such an interesting business that way because often you're writing the thing uh, that'll come out in a few years while the, while the first thing's coming out. And so your brain is always, you know, in, in different books at the same time. Uh, so I actually, I kept the email to my agent that I sent when I first had the idea of the embroidered book. So I have that email so I can go back and check it. And it was in late 2015. Uh, that I first had the idea. I said, you know, I, this would be ambitious. This would be a pretty big book, but I think I could pull it off. And my wonderful agent said, yep, you know, do what you want. But that was before my first novel even came out, before my novellas came out. Um, and I also have written some uh, interactive fiction games, short stories, all of that in the meantime. So I was working on the embroidered book um, while I was working on other things. And I just, I knew I had to do so much research that often I would just you know, take time uh, at the end of the day to to read a book or to make some notes. Uh, so it was a long process, but it wasn't all devoted to the embroidered book. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, I find it amazing that you can flip in and as somebody who's always been a journalist, that mm -hmm. you has never written any fiction, the fact that you can flip in and out of, of mm -hmm. a different raft of creative tales. I, I mean, I can do it as a reader, we all do, right? Multiple books yeah. on the go. But I just can't imagine the headspace it requires to actually be able to flip in and out of writing projects. Yeah, yeah, I, I like doing that. I, I find, you know, a change is as good as a rest sometimes for my brain. Um, but the one, the one thing that I do, uh, I, I think it does, that's not so great for me is that uh, I keep changing time periods. So I, you know, I can't really reuse my research. So I'm constantly, uh, you know, researching different time periods. Uh, I tend to mostly focus on, on Europe, um, but I bounce around centuries a lot. So. Uh, it's not the most efficient, but it's great for curiosity and it keeps me interested. Yeah, it keeps you mentally agile. Um, mm -hmm. And speaking of which, you're, you're flipping into working inside the Assassin's Creed universe as well, right, mm -hmm. this year? The Magus yeah. Conspiracy, that's your Assassin's Creed novel, if I'm right. Yeah, yeah, and that is set in the um, Victorian time period. Uh, so again, you know, I just decided why not take a different <laughs> a different century and uh, and get a whole bunch of research books and and uh, yeah, it's it's been really fascinating. That's coming out this summer, and it's uh, such a, a a neat privilege to be able to work in the Assassin's Creed universe. I haven't I haven't written a tie-in novel before. I've I've done original work um, almost exclusively, with uh, the exception of a little bit of video game work. Uh, so uh, it's neat to me to be able to work in in this big big world and and add my own voice to it. Oh, yes, yeah, so lovely. And it's set in the Victorian era. Where is, where's the location of the novel? Um, it bounces around uh, uh, different parts of Europe. So it's um, mostly parts of the Assassin's Creed universe that we haven't seen uh, explored before. Ah, wonderful. And, mm -hmm. and to flip, so we've got, a, we've got a, a vast amount of fans here at Forbidden Planet of Assassin's Creed, of course. But we also, as I mentioned earlier, have, have a vast amount of fans of the embroidered book. I, I don't think I've ever seen a book open in the story when, when it's arrived that people have, have flipped out about as much as they have about this beautiful edition, or mm -hmm. it's, which you must be so pleased with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just gorgeous. Uh, Andrew Davis did such a wonderful job on the cover and the entire production team, the internal design, you know, the, the chapter headings, the table of contents, I mean, all of it is just uh, gorgeous and so thoughtful the way that it's all put together. 
Um, so yeah, I'm just, I couldn't be more pleased and, you know, I couldn't have imagined a cover that uh, would suit the book better than the one that it has. I think it has a, a lovely tactile quality to it as well. Mm -hmm. So, so, which is which such an important part of, I think it's evocative of what you're writing about and connects very mm -hmm. much to mm -hmm. sometimes you get beautiful editions of books. You think, well, this is a very nice edition of the book, but mm -hmm. somehow your edition is, is kind of redolent of what you're actually writing about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And, and it was so important to me too, because the, the title, you know, the title took a long time to come to me, but it really represents to me several different meanings of, uh, you know, there, there is an actual embroidered book in the plot of, of the novel. Uh, but of course, it also refers on a bigger level to the embroidered book of history and how we keep re-embroidering and pulling out threads and, and changing our ideas of what happened. And um, so the fact that the cover uh, really emphasizes that that part of it and the um, the design elements work to uh, to support that theme you know is is just great for an author it's lovely and and, and Kate what's next for you uh well I have to finish the Assassin's Creed book so <laughs> 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 I'm on deadline for that so I'm going to uh I, I've got to knock that one uh, out and I've got um, a few other novels that are in the works that my agent uh has uh, in various states of repair. So um, yeah, different uh, periods of history. And I definitely have a lot of a lot more books coming down uh, in the next few years. Fantastic. Well, well, thank you for, for producing the embroidered book. Thanks for working with us on, on our exclusive, which is lovely and available from the links attached to our conversation. I can't wait to see the Assassin's Creed book and I can't wait to see what you do next. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for this. I'm such a big fan of Forbidden Planet. Uh, you know, last time I was in London, I, I brought my kid. Uh, it was like a little pilgrimage going to Forbidden Planet. And it's just, uh, it's been such an honor. There's nothing I love more than speaking to uh, a Forbidden Planet customer slash visitor. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's a, it is truly a special place, you know. So uh, mm -hmm. the fact that you uh, get to come and hang out with us when you're in town is great. And yeah. please come and visit us again, Kate. Will do. Yeah, very soon, I hope, if all goes yeah. well. Fingers <laughs> crossed. We'll Fingers crossed. Yes. You take exactly. care and have a wonderful day. L lovely to meet you. And thanks for writing yes. the embroidered book. Same here. Thanks so much. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.